ylävero. No problem. My grandma took that from me. Come on, cuz. Okay, if I could, can I grab a coffee first, Doc? This is a short one, all right? Yeah, come on, come on. I appreciate it. I have We have questions online. I let the people, uh, let me know when they get it online. I'm going to answer all the questions. Get it on as usual, all right? Come on, come on, sir. Well, Monday, you might as well just make the coffee when you come in. Come on, guys. Just in case that, won't, that way it doesn't jam you up later. Wow. Come on, guys. Time we got on the coffee. Two minutes. Five, five minutes. Sir. All right. What's the first question? Kyle, Kyle, brother, asked. So, like, so like I want. Who would be considered the Philistines in today's society? Okay. Is that the only question? Oh, uh, there's other questions, sir. Go ahead. Let me hear them. Kyle, Kyle. The other question is, brother, asked. So like, showing your whole life to the. Is there any significance to the Lord's left hand? Scriptures say Christ is at his right hand. He will the power. I got you. If there's a precept you're referring to with the left hand, just let me know that, all right? If not, I'll, I'll answer the question. All right, anything else? Kyle Khan, brother asks, was, was Saul really talking to the demon, 
or was it slow? Was Saul talking to Samuel, or was that you know the angel of the Lord messing with Saul? Right, I think I understand. Okay, anything else? Come on, God. It's just wanted to break down in Matthew eighteen and twenty. Okay, all right. Uh, I'll give everyone a few minutes to come in, and then I'll answer your questions. All right, just stack them for me. All right. Come on, get ready. No problem. Let me know what the, what the usual amount is we started, all right? Whenever we get that. Oh, so I do. To pass that. Okay. You can get started if you want, sir. Whenever I'm ready. Kyle Wilkinson. All right, clap it up. Bring it on up and All right, I'll answer your question today. Uh, we'll go over any questions you might have about the Lord's Passover that just passed. Give the most high hand. The most high feast of unleavened bread. It just passed. We'll go over any questions that you might have about that as well. Um, uh, we'll also go over the upcoming barbecues. Remind me of that. All right. And of course, I'll break the entire history of man down, the meaning of life, everything that is that is important to you, and make very small the things that you distract yourselves with every day. Everybody understands, right? First question, let's go. Brother, that's a lot going on. Who would be considered the Philistines today in society? The Philistines today in society, you can look this up in your Bazaar Bible Dictionary, right? Okay, to my memory, I have to double check with commanding General, commanding General Yohanna, but to, to my memory, uh, there's the people down in the Sudan. Like, there's a certain people, I believe, that live in the Sudan, southern Sudan. That could be right. Come on. I think that's Matsuzari, sir. That's what it is. Like, Matsuzari is a southern Sudan. The uh, real Egyptians or the ancient Egyptians, the the Philistines. It's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't recall it. Check, check in your Zondervan Bible dictionary. That might jog my memory. Otherwise, I'd have to just ask Commanding Commanding General Yohanna. All right. This is Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary. The Philip page four hundred and fifty-seven out of the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary. The Philistines, Palestinia, a people who would have the Philistine plain of Palestine during the greater part of the Old Testament. Their country extended from Joppa to less of Gaza and had five great cities. Skip down now. Skip down to the people that were expelled from the land of Palestine before the Arabs took it over. All right, where they're at now. Or you can Google it. Go ahead. Oh, they were the sir. The Canaanites, those are the Philistines. The Canaanites? And the Canaanites are South Africans. So that's who the Philistines would be. The Philistines would be the South Africans, all right? The people of South Africa, that completely jogged my memory just now. That's who the Philistines are, the people you call today South Africans, or who the Bible calls the people of Canaan. Those are the Philistines, all right? Good to go. Who's a famous South African? I don't know any. They got it has to be some. Go ahead. Nelson Mandela. There you go. Nelson Mandela would be a Philistine. In the past, he would be a Philistine. He's a famous Canaanite, a famous South African. Good to go. Next. Final mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's Shalom, Lord, praise God. Is there any significance to the Lord's left hand? Scriptures say Christ is at the right hand power. Okay, unless there's a precept you're referring to, there is no significance to the Most High's left hand, right? In the Bible, when when um when James and John came before the Lord to join the school, his mother wanted her sons to sit on his right and on his left. So the, the only significance the left hand would be is that it's less powerful than your right. So the one who is highest in rank would sit directly to your right, 
The next person under him would sit directly to your left. That's the significance of the left hand. But there is no negative connotation to a left hand. It's just not as powerful as the right. Everybody understands. Next. Power, power. Okay. Sister asks, when Saul spoke with the soothsayer, did he really speak with Samuel or was it a demon? Okay. It was not a demon. It was the spirit of the Lord. It was exactly what Samuel would have told him. So to be exact, it was the most high. The most high spoke to Saul that day. Though so he wanted to speak to Samuel, but what he spoke to was the most high. It was not actually Samuel because it was in a vision, a vision that was had by a woman who was a hustler and a charlatan and was so shocked because she never has any vision. This was the first time she had a real vision and it stunned her. But this was a real vision. This was a, this was a real vision. And in essence, Saul spoke to the most high. Now, how do people speak to the most high? Through, the, through his angels. All right. That's how anyone speaks to the most high on earth. And so when, when you break this down, you want to break down that she talked to the Lord. The Lord spoke to her. The Lord spoke to her. The vision I'm sorry, the Lord spoke to Samuel. The vision he saw was a vision of Samuel. That's the vision that the witch saw. But that was the most high that it was doing the communicating. Everyone understands. Go ahead. Come, come, sir. Mm -hmm. Just lock it. Sister wanted a question, a general breakdown. Come, come. Just the one in the general breakdown of Matthew 18 and verse 20. Mm -hmm. I know Christians use this when they come together in church. All right, let's read it. Come, come. This is the book of Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20. For where two or more, like, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. This is an excellent precept. This is a very one West UPK precept. This, however, could never refer to anything in Christianity for one very specific reason. Christians do not come together in the name of Christ. That's not why they're together. They're, if, if two Christians come together, they are not coming together for Christ. None of them. There is no, there are no two Christians that have ever come together in the name of Christ. I'll give you some very simple examples. If they come together in a church on Sunday, then they absolutely aren't coming together in the name of Christ because Christ didn't worship the sun. So Christ would not venerate and make holy Sunday the way that sun worshipers in the past venerated Sunday and made it, a, made it the Sabbath of Christianity. So if, you're, if you are worshiping on Sunday, you're not doing it for Christ. Because that's not what Christ did. Christ celebrated the Passover. Christ celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Christ kept the commandments. Christ rocked fringes. Christ was an Israelite and behaved in, a, in concordance with Israelite culture. So if you're coming together in the Christian church, you're just two Christians coming together, but you're not doing it for Christ. And if you don't believe me, wait until you two start fighting each other over which one molested whose child over which one stole from the other, over which one slept with the other's woman, over which one lied to the other. When Christians come together, they'll show you who they are coming together for when they molest your child and steal from you and lie to you and sleep with your wife. And everybody will know why they came together. I pray you understand. Next question. Come on, come on sir. Brother, let me uh, break down. Coffee's done, Warrior. Um, I'm going to Please, go on. I'm going to make sure you two and two, go on. Okay. Come on, Brother, let me break down uh, 2 Peter 2 and 4 through 7. Let's hear it. Come on, This is the book of 2 Peter, chapter 2, and verse 4. 
For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be preserved unto judgment. The angels that the Lord did not spare are speaking about us, his messengers, the right. children of Israel. When you look at that word, that word angel means messengers, right? This is the precept that the Catholic Church has used. And then by proxy, the Christian Church has used to say that there was some war in heaven, meaning where the Lord sits, and there was a rebellion of angels led by Satan, and they were all cast down from hell, I mean, from heaven into hell. That's Greek mythology. That's not true, all right? That's not what this precept is talking about. We are the messengers who the Most High threw down and out of our position, man, the Israelites. We're his angels. And when you read and when you read this chapter all the way up, the officer once we can read a few verses, he's describing the most high's treatment towards Israel in the Old Testament. Why is he doing that? To teach the Israelites of today, of present time, that he will hurt you if you disobey him because he hurt your forefathers. He will throw you away because he threw them away. Meaning, and I appreciate it, Warrior. Meaning as you become someone that follows Christ and because you truly follow Christ, you will follow the God of Israel and keep his commandments. Don't think that he is long suffering with foolishness because he is not. Don't think he's somebody that will just forgive you time and time again, though you break his commandments and you don't keep his law. He didn't forgive them over and over. He threw them away. He cast them out. He destroyed them. So now you better understand that he'll do the same thing to you. He did it to your grandfather. He'll do it to you. That's the point of the book of Jude. That's the whole point. Everybody understands. All right. This is not talking about, you know, the fairy tale that your Christian pastor has told you. Everybody understands. Next. Come on, come on. Brother wanted to break down of Isaiah 63 and verse 1 through 3, sir. Go ahead. Come on, come. This is the book of Isaiah, chapter 63, and verse 1. Who is that that coming from Edom with dyed garments from Bazaar? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, righteousness mighty to save. Yeah, this is talking about, this is the precept for Christ, young warrior, right? This is speaking about Christ. He's the one coming from Edom as a man who has just slaughtered his enemies. This is speaking about Yahweh Christ. This is a precept in the Old Testament about the destruction that is going to happen when our king returns. A lot of you are scared to death of the COVID-19 virus. I, I really saw you Christians and saw really how you don't believe in the Bible, and really that you're not ready for terrible times. Right. Well, if the COVID-19 virus scares you to death, then how will you handle the third world's war? How will you handle the race wars? That's right. The race wars are coming, man. Don't you see that? You can, you can look outside and you can tell when it's about to rain, but yet you cannot tell the sign of the times. You can't see that there's a race war. The Democrats and the Republicans are brewing up to a race war. They're brewing. There's going to be civil war in America, in Great Britain, in Germany. There's going to be civil war. The political parties that for years have, have tried to stomach one another, now because of the lack of resources and the COVID-19 COVID virus, they don't have the resources, they don't have the patience, and now they're going to physically fight one another as they did in the days of old. There's war coming and destruction coming that your pastor isn't ready for. He's an expert piano player, man. Right. He's an expert dancer. He's a wonderful songwriter and choreographer. But he is not a man of God, and he is not someone that you can rely on when the times to come come. Right. Everyone understands. I believe that's the answer. Need a little bit something else up here. Go ahead. So, uh, brother asked, Shalom, why the Catholic Church pray or worship to Yahweh's mother 
and the Catholic Church so called saints to follow. I appreciate it because it, because Roman Catholicism is just that Roman, and the Romans worshipped women. The Romans had many uh, mother gods, many of them. Mainly, the one you want to look at is what's the what begins with an M. Oh, uh, she was a god of peace. She's who Mary is. May Maya Salaka. Look up Maya. When you when you see the the Catholics worship Mary, it is actually when you see the Roman Catholics worship Mary, it is that's something they were doing before Mary, before Jesus, before the New Testament. It's the worship of the goddess Maya and the goddess June Juna. Look up. Put two pictures of them up on the screen. The goddess Maya and the goddess Juna are what you call today Mother Mary. Blessed Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. They use that precept, take that, and now they have invented a new God, and they call her the Virgin Mary. But really, it's just Roman worship, man, and it was around before, before Jesus. You want to look up June, the month of June is named after the original Virgin Mary. The month of May is named after the original of Virgin Mary, Maya and Juno or June. Whenever the warrior gets it, it'll, it'll just, all you need is a picture of it that's going to look just like Mary. The statue of Juno and Maya and blah, blah, blah. You want to move on or not? It's kind of I'm, I'm cool with it now. So if you want me to put it on that screen, you want me to just let everybody in the class. Is that, everybody, is that what's simpler? If it's simpler, as long as you're aware, you know that that's the picture I want. If not, you have to show it to me so I can confirm, all right? Come, come. This is um, Maya. That's Maya. That's all right, man. That's Maya. You can show me the other ones. So this is another picture. Go ahead, sir. That's a pretty good one. That's so similar to that Virgin Mary in the Catholic Church. You can find a thousand of these, if not more than that, all over the place. And, and that's Juno. And that's Juno. Juno was the god of, goddess of peace and love, and it's just Mary worship. The Catholics, the Romans, had thousands of gods, and many of them were women, right? And they worshiped these women as goddesses. Shalom, warrior. And that's exactly what the Roman Catholics are doing today with Mary. Everybody understands. It's the exact same thing, the same statues, the same praying to her, the same bowing to her, the same believing that she'll help you and praying and she's merciful. And it's just Roman belief, but it is, has nothing to do with Mary, man. Mary was a sister, man. And Mary was not in the truth. Mary was any sister struggling with a baby and struggling with a burden that she did not understand, but she did the best she could. But Mary was not a, one of the 12 disciples. She was not in the truth. Everybody understands that. Okay, now, is she blessed? She's absolutely blessed because she had Christ and suckled him and rose him up to be a young man that was healthy and fed. And then, of course, the Most High had to take it from there. Everybody understands. Go ahead. And you on your own, you can look up a thousand pictures of Mary and Maya, and you will see the similarities between Mary, Maya, and Juno. All right. I think they're going to worship Mother's Day soon, right? Is that coming up or did that pass already? Right? It's coming. It's coming up. Yeah, that's Mother's Day. Is the worship of the goddess Maya? That's her worship, Maya, right? In May. June, I believe they have something else. I can't recall what they have in June. Some type of father. It's father, not Father's Day though. Father's Day is just the answer to Mother's Day. It has no significance at all. It's about the end of the uh, Civil War. But my May, Mother's Day, come on. Oh, Juneteenth? Not Juneteenth. When is, um, when is, what's the Easter? That just passed, sir. I started. Easter passed. Okay, that's the, the goddess of the star, right? Come on. Come on. It's something I'll think about later. I can't recall it right now. All of it is the worship of strange gods. The month itself is named to worship the strange god of June, of Juno. Come on. While it's on topic, since they just typed it, you want to know where Tri Mary was from? 
Mary was a Levite, right? All indications in the Bible say that Mary was a Levite because her cousins were Levites. Mary was the cousin of John the Baptist. Right. John the Baptist was a Levite. Mary's, Mary's sister was Elizabeth. That was her sister. Elizabeth was the mother of John the Baptist. Everybody understands. And of course, Levites had to marry other Levites. They couldn't marry outside of their tribe. They had to marry other Levites in the same station that they were in in life. Everybody understands. Mary was a Levite, a Levite, which you would call today a Haitian. Joseph was from the tribe of Judah, the people you would call today the so-called Negroes. His wife, Mary, was from the tribe of Levi, the people you would call today the so-called Haitians. Everyone understands. Go ahead. I'm going to break down in Revelation 12 and verse 7. Let's do it. Kind of, kind of, look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was there place. Read it one more time. Kind of, look, kind of, sir. Revelation chapter 12, and verse 7. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. You know what it might be? It might be Cinco de Mayo. But Cinco de Mayo is about... That war they had with the Spanish, the Spanish. I would have to ask an Issacharite who's very used to celebrating it if they mingle in a lot of Mary worship for Cinco de Mayo. All right, you got to check that out on your own. Come on. Cinco de Mayo is actually this month. It's actually Wednesday, sir. It's actually Wednesday. Now, Cinco de Mayo is about a war, a revolutionary war that they fought with the Spanish. That's what it's. It's it's very similar to Juneteenth. And that it's a historical event and a fairly recent historical event, considering uh, it doesn't have any spiritual um, connotations at all, unless they begin to worship, you know, the Mother Mary during Cinco de Mayo. But you'd have to ask someone that knows about it. All right, go ahead. Connor, Connor, sir. Revelations twelve and verse seven. And there was a war in heaven. There was what? A war in heaven. There was what? And there was war in heaven. This is the first thing you have to remember, okay? This is not talking about where the Lord lives. This is talking about where you live. Right. You live in heaven, just not yours. But you absolutely live in heaven, brother. You absolutely. I was driving through New York a few hours ago, man. And I was looking, I was down in Soho, man, and I'm watching it, looking at these devils like live in these big loft departments. I looked at them like drinking coffee out of that sidewalk. Even with the COVID-19, this is how in heaven our oppressor is. Because of the COVID-19 virus, he can't eat inside or drink inside in New York. So he's eating on the sidewalk. and But he's eating on the sidewalk, brother, in such a wonderful situation with flowers, and tables and a waiter and his dog is drinking out of a bowl under the table. Even in the COVID-19 virus, because of COVID-19, they've turned cities like New York and Chicago into Paris. Now there's outdoor cafes because you can't eat inside. So now New York even looks more like Paris than it did before because people have to eat outside and their dogs are drinking out of bowls. And the waiters are coming over to the table and they're enjoying the springtime and the summertime in New York. And I look at them and go, this man is in heaven and nothing changes his heaven. Nothing. Come on. Could you bring it out? It's so heavy, sir. I was uh, rolling down uh, South Creek the other day. You know what I mean? I was like, man, Esau is outside. All their restaurants huh. they got the perfect setup. They got room huh. good. They got huh. you know, tables all set up. Like because of COVID-19, they had to bring the restaurant outside which made it more beautiful, made it more glorious and lovely and scenic and like Paris, France. These men are in heaven. But guess what? This is the prophecy you're reading about in the book of Revelation. This is before the Catholics changed the name of this book. This book used to be called the book of the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. That was the original name of this book, the book of Revelations. But that name was deemed to be too aggressive and too scary. So the Catholics changed the name from the book of the apocalypse of Jesus Christ to the book of Revelations because the, the book of Revelations is about the destruction that Jesus Christ is going to bring to their heaven. He's going to destroy their Paris. Right. 
He's going to destroy their place of blessing, their place of wonderfulness. He's going to destroy it, man. There will be war in heaven. That's what John saw. He saw war in heaven. That's the point. And remember, when you're reading the book of Revelations, you're reading a vision had by a man. So it's a metaphor for something else. You understand? It's not, you know, like watching a reality show or seeing something real happen in front of you. It's a vision. And like every dream, one thing represents another. Everyone understands. All right, go ahead. So he sees war in heaven. War in heaven represents this wonderful, beautiful place of peace. Now is wonderful no more. Now is pleasant no more. Now is peaceful no more. Keep going. Kyle O'Connor, sir. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. That's judgment day. Huh? Michael and his angels you know who that is. That's the armies of the living God, Yahweh, man. That's his military. Michael is in charge of that army under Yahweh Shai Christ. And he's coming back with his army at the orders of Christ, who is coming back at the orders of the Most High, like any military. And they are going to fight the dragon. Right. That's a metaphor. The dragon, right? Now, John sees them fighting a dragon, but it's a metaphor, it's a vision. What is that vision? There is a nation, there is an army that flies through the sky and rains death down on its victims on the earth, right? Look up for your precepts, what you need is when America gained air superiority. America is the dragon. Our oppressor is the dragon. I believe it was in 1976. When America, you can look it up, when America gained air superiority over the sky. They own the sky, America. There is no country that has supremacy over America in the sky itself. America is the dragon. Our oppressor is the dragon. Once again, when I say America, America is at the head of the dragon, but the dragon is Spain. Great Britain, Germany, give me some more. Switzerland, Ireland, Scotland. Any more am I missing? You know them all. All right, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Our oppressor, he's the dragon because he is red and he rains fire down from the sky. Right. Everyone understands. Keep going. Come on, come. And the dragon fought. And if I could say one thing, if I could, uh, can you imagine reading this scripture or being given this vision all of those thousands of years ago when no one flew? No one flew. Everyone was on horseback or mule or chariot. And then one day in the night, I think 1919, the Wright brothers, the Wright brothers made an airplane. Before them, Leonardo da Vinci was trying to make a flying craft. He would watch hummingbirds, different birds and bats, and, and dissect bats and dissect hummingbirds, trying to master flight. That's what Leonardo da Vinci did, man, when he worked for the Medici over there in Florence, Italy. And he tried that, and he tried it, and he tried it, and was never quite successful, but left, pro left plans and blueprints, the same blueprints that later on they used to make the helicopter from a hummingbee from a hummingbird, so like, and to make aircraft from bats and to learn pitch and yaw and, and, uh, and, uh, and what's that, pitch, yaw, you really didn't know about flight, you can look that up, pitch, yaw and something else, I forget, those are the three things you need for flight, someone look that up, pitch, yaw and something else before it drives me crazy, all right, these are just concepts that you need, these are the things you need to take a plane off the ground, right, and our oppressor has been studying these things since since cave drawings, come on, y'all pitch and roll. The what? Y'all pitch and roll or roll? Roll, roll. Y'all pitch and roll. These are the concepts that allow aircraft to get into the sky. Everybody understands, right? They've been studying it, brother, since cave drawings. Trying, trying, trying to get up there, knowing that they have to get up there. 
They have to get up there. They did the same thing when they built the when those Hamites built the Tower of Babel, trying to reach the Most High God to bring him down, to go to war with him. Our oppressor achieved it, brother. He achieved the ability to get up there. And now because of that, he believes he can defeat the Lord our God because he has the crafts. He has the UFOs. He has flying saucers of his own. He had, he can rain fire down from the sky like a dragon. And because of that, he believes he can defeat the Lord our God. And this is a vision about that war. Everyone knows what an actual physical dragon is, right? It's what it's what people would call today a pterodactyl, right? That's a dragon. It's not science fiction. It's an animal that actually existed at one time. Everybody understands. Keep going. Cut on one cut, sir. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. And the dragon fought Michael and his angels and the dragon prevailed not. This is future prophecy that John received 2,000 years ago, man. Our oppressor is not going to defeat the Lord and his army. That's, that's important for you to understand because in your smallness, you can become very petty and think that your everyday life is how the future will be. Think that your small problems are the same problems that will overtake you in the future. But to believe in the Bible is to believe you are far larger than what our oppressor wants you to think, man. Right. The future will not be like the past, God. You understand? We're climbing towards an enormous victory, and the book of Revelations is speaking about it. Our oppressor will not be victorious against our king, against my Ka'ala and the angels under him. They're going to lose. So the same, the same way today, you think that the only way you can make it is to do some scheme. I hear, I hear some people in the world, they're doing a thousand different schemes with PPP loans. I didn't know when the hell that was until yesterday. A PPP, does everyone know what a PPP loan is? Uh, right, there's a, a PPP loan is a loan that's supposed to go to um, business owners that our oppressor provides to give business owners help because of course all of the businesses are shut down. But it's a loan. So people in the world are telling other people that they'll apply for that loan and you'll get the money and you will never have to pay it back. And the white man and our oppressor will never come looking for you. He won't even know about it at all. And that is of course what people in the world say to effing idiots who are the new, who will be the new uh, inmates in prison. Right? That's the next generation of our brothers and sisters that will be in jail. People who believe some fool who thinks they don't ever get caught for committing crime. Who in that? Everyone thinks that. I remember when selling drugs was something that no one could get locked up for. No one would ever know. Shooting somebody, killing somebody, no one cares, no one will ever know. The most time knows, and he knows that your crime is because you have no faith in the war to come. There's a war to free you. You don't need to get free because of crime and schemes and scams. That, or that will free you. You believe the only way you can ever come up in society is to steal, lie, and become a dishonorable man. That is not where success lies, brother. It's where destruction lies. And all you do by being a criminal and a scam artist and a filthy bastard is become someone that does not deserve the Lord's protection. That's right. That's all. But for those of us that want his protection and that will wait upon it, there's going to be war in heaven and our enemy will not prevail. I pray you understand. Next. Do I need more? If I need more, read it. You answered it, sir. Solid. Next. Brother Ash. Salah, can I get a breakdown of the glorified body versus immortality? Solid. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming he's speaking about a, a precept. If so let's read it, all right? So I hear it with you. The glorified body versus immortality? Oh, damn. He probably speaks, he's probably talking about um. There's a warring in my members or a 
there's a war between my flesh and the spirit. I assume, but just wait for him to answer the question. I'll be more specific about your question, all right? Next question. Come, come. Brother Ashley, sir, if I may, is there a particular reason why Yahweh Shah told Israel to tell no one after he performed a miracle? There is an absolute reason why Yahweh Shah said that. Humility. You've heard of it before, right? It's something that isn't valued much at all in this world, but it is of great value to Christ and it is of great value to command in general Yahana. Humility, y'all. That's why. That's why wanting to do a righteous thing, but wanting no credit for it. Wanting it to not be acknowledged at all, but just wanting to do it with, for the look for the eyes of the most high and for the person you've done it, you did it for. Humility is the reason that Christ did that. Up. Next question. Oh, that's another question. So. Oh, so it's just, okay. just want to break down John 3 16. Go ahead and pull it. Give me the precept to go with it, all right? Go ahead. This is the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our right, young warriors, what I'm about to give you right now is the John 3 16 breakdown. It is as old as the UPK. You should do it. You should not vary much from what you're about to hear. I will allow you to vary some, some, but be careful because this breakdown has been through many battles, many battles, and it works. Everyone understands. Read it one more time. Now, you notice I let him read it first. That's what you need to do. You have to let him read the whole thing straight out first. Why? So that the Christian will think, I got it. I got you now. You just read, for God so loved the world, which, of course, when you're a black or Hispanic Christian, the only thing you hear is world, because black or Hispanic Christians are combing the Bible for some way for God to love them, even though they're a nigger and a spick. They're combing the Bible for it. They know they're worthless and a nigger and a spick, but they're trying to find some way in the Bible for God to care about them too and white people because a Chris, a black or Hispanic Christian can't even understand the concept of God preferring them above all people. They just want to eat the crumbs that fall from the table of our oppressor. And so that's why they always love John 3, 16. Shalom says, but when they meet one West, they hear about us saying that our oppressor cannot be saved. And so they pull this same scripture, which most of them, this is the only scripture they know anyway. Everyone understands. So you read it one more time. Go ahead. God, we're going to look at John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When you're reading on the street, say, for God, read it again, do this. Come, come. For God so loved the world. God so loved the what? The world. The what? The world. The what? The world. Are you doing that? The Christian will listen like, yeah, that's the same word. I guess. I'm, I'm, I'm confounding you now. So you on purpose do what he wants. It says world, right? Yes, it says world. Hallelujah. It says world. Keep reading. Come, come. And he gave his only begotten son. Keep going. That whosoever. That what? That whosoever. That what? That whosoever. The Christian is like, yes, whosoever. That means my supervisor can be saved. <laughs> yes, that's all I care about is my supervisor getting saved. Thank you. He'll love it. You read it for him three times. Keep going. Oh, God. Believe it in him should not perish. He won't perish. He won't die. Go ahead. But have everlasting life. But have everlasting life. Now, I'm going to give you this breakdown, but it's a little easier now to break this down because so many Christians did perish, didn't they? Didn't they, right? right? Oh, they did. So many people that believe in the name of Jesus are dead, which means they perished. They did not have everlasting life. They died of the COVID-19 COVID virus. Right, they're gone. Grandmama's gone. Your mama's gone. Your daddy's gone. All of you Christians who just 
were sanctified Holy Ghost people, they're dead. They're dead. What does the UPK do? Have a giant party for the Passover. That's all we do all the time. Give your man Juliana. We are have a party because, because we're not afraid of needles. So we're, so we're not scared of needles. So we do believe in medicine and doctors and vaccinations. And we do believe in the Most High's protection using anything that he wants to use. The Christians, however, they perished. They're dead. So now you can add that in now to the current thing. So the first thing the Christian will need is world. Precept. Come, come. This is the book of Psalms, chapter 90, verse 2. Go ahead. Before the mountains were brought forth, forever thou hast formed the earth and the world. Now remember, Christian, it said the earth and the world. What does that show you? That there is a difference between the earth and the world. When you read John 3 and 16, you in your silly, stupid mind make the earth and the world equal. Right. But the earth and the world are two different things. Right. When you look up the word world in your Webster's Dictionary, it will say society or age thereof. Right. That's why in Florida there's a sea world and there's a Disney world and there's a old world and a new world. Right. Some of you idiots walk around in a world of your own. Right. Right. World doesn't mean the earth. There, that is two different things. Right. Keep going. Oh, God. This is the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and verse 3. Keep going. Through faith, we understand that the world. That's the what? The world. Let's spell that word. W-O-R-L-D-S. So the first precept, Psalms 90, let us know that the earth and the world are two different things. And Hebrews, it's showing you that there are more than one world because there's an S at the end of worlds. So there are many worlds. There's one earth and there's many worlds. So we know that there is a world that Jesus Christ died for, that whosoever should believe on him should have everlasting life and not perish. That's a fact. But because I know the earth and the world are not the same thing, I can't think it, it refers to everyone on the earth. Right. And because I know that there is more, more than, there are more than one world or worlds, I have to figure out which world that Jesus Christ died for. Okay. Precept. Okay. You know it, Warrior? You got it. Isaiah? Isaiah 45, 17. Let the brother up front read for you. You're correct. And give him a hand. Come on. Come on. Let me read 1 John 2 15 first. Let's hear it. I believe you're right. Come. This is the book of 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. Love not the world. Read that again. Love not the world. If you need more proof that there are more than one, there is more than one world, we know that the world in John 3 and 16, Christ loves. And died for. But here's a world that Christ is saying he does not love. What color is this written in? Oh, this is, uh, first, John. first John, Salah. But this is the other one. There's another one in, in, in John that I also read that I pray not for them, but I pray for the John, I pray 17 and John 17 and 9. I pray not for them, but I pray for mine also. Come. You can use that one for your precept, but this is perfect as well. Come. Love not the world. Come. This world God doesn't love and doesn't want you to love. Right. He doesn't want you to love this world either. Love not the world. Go ahead. Neither the things that are in the world. Neither the things in the world. So what, what is the definition of a world? A people, place, or society, or time. Right. That is what a world is. This world God doesn't want you to love right. or anything in it. He doesn't like this society. He doesn't like these people. He doesn't like their culture. And he doesn't want you to love them. But there is a world. There is a world that God loves. Loved them so much that he killed his son to save them. What world does God love? What world is so beloved of God that he would kill the greatest man to ever walk the face of the earth? Also, oh, that world could have everlasting life so that they don't have to die of the next plague. So that they don't have to die when the race wars and the civil war comes to America. So that they don't have to die when Christ returns on right. Judgment Day. Which world did God so love? Read. Oh, God. 
This is the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, and verse 17. But Israel. But what? But Israel. But what? But Israel. But Israel. What is Israel? Israel is the, speaking about the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. From the so-called Negro all the way down to the Hispanics or the Mexicans, the people you call today blacks and Hispanics. They are the nation of Israel. Read it again. Come, on, come. On. But Israel Go ahead. shall be saved. Shall be what? Shall be saved. Shall be what? Shall be saved. The Lord said he would save the Israelites. He promised it, man. The Lord keeps his promise. He doesn't like you. I know you don't, whatever you say, I mean, everyone has to take it with a grain of salt. That's the phrase, right? Which right. means you're a goddamn liar and no one can believe you. Right. right? No right. one can listen to you or base anything that they do on what you say. But that's not how the Most High operates up. Right. The Lord said he would save Israel. He promised it. Right. He cast them off in the strange lands because of their disobedience to punish them. But he still promised that one day he would save them. Right. And he will. He will. Keep going. Come, come. In the Lord. In the Lord. Meaning that salvation will come from what? From, from PPP loan scams? It will come from what? Bank scams, credit card scam. What's the other scam that blacks and Hispanics love in the That every sinner loves, not just black people. With the children, when you get the children, and who are you gonna claim on the taxes? Tax returns. Tax returns. Lying about kids you never seen, <laughs> never take care of, never bought one uh, lunchable for. Because you, of course, need $2,000 from the government even though you never took care of the child at all, right? You think that will save you. I get you. Come on now, please. You think that will save you. Well, the Lord said this about the Israelites. Huh? They will be saved in the Lord, meaning the Most High will save them. When you pay your bills, you give credit to your hustling, to your scamming and your thievery and your lying. That's who you can say, boy, it's a good thing I'm a thief. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to take care of my daughter. It's a good thing I'm a thief. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to pay my bills. <clears throat> it's a good thing I'm such a good liar. Because otherwise, how would I have been able to pay my bills this month? I, you can give your credit to what saved you. But the Most High said he would save Israel up. And he deserves the credit. And one day he's going to get it. He's going to get the credit for what he has done for his people, brother. Keep going. Carnival come. With an everlasting salvation. With a what? Everlasting salvation. Meaning this salvation doesn't run out. He made this promise thousands of years ago. It's still valid today. It doesn't run out. It doesn't run out whether or not you were a drug addict or a drug dealer or a homosexual or a rapist or a liar or a thief or a scam artist. This salvation, brother, you can take hold of if you're willing to change, mm -hmm. if you're willing to amend your ways. It's everlasting. It's not something that only existed in the Old Testament. It's not something that only is valid in the New Testament. Right. It's something that is valid forever. Right. Everlasting forever. Keep going. Conor, Conor, Ye shall not be ashamed. You won't be ashamed anymore. And there is, I mean, there's almost nothing that is more shameful than being black or Hispanic. Mm -hmm. It's a shameful thing. You're ashamed of it. You're ashamed of it. The next time you change your voice when a white person calls your house, you'll know you're ashamed. You'll know that you're just ashamed of you, ashamed of who you are. Your God doesn't look like you. Your, your Savior doesn't look like you. Most of you, some of you, the woman in your bed doesn't look like you. Right? You, you are absolutely ashamed of everything that is you. But there's a time coming when you won't be ashamed anymore. That's right, sir. There's a time coming when you're going to look at blacks and Hispanics and see the beauty that they inherently possess, the beauty they possess by God, the character that they possess from God. And you won't be ashamed to be a nigger anymore. Right. You won't be ashamed to be a spit anymore. Keep going. Come, come. Nor confounded. Nor confounded. What does the term confounded mean? Confused. Right. Confused. And blacks and Hispanics, who is more confused than us? Right. You got five different races. You're black, African-American. Give me some more. Mulatto at one time. 
black, mulatto, African American, Afro American. That was in a that was a brief time in the seventies. Come on, Negro, Negro nigger, Asiatic black, Asiatic black man. How did I forget? How could I forget? Colored, come on. The original man. The original man. <laughs> like, I mean, if you put all that down in the job application log, you'd be there all night. Right. Like, that's <laughs> a thousand different races to put down on the job. That's right. And when they read it, they're just going to not hire you. <laughs> not everybody understand. Right, right, right. Come on, man. We're confused. Go, go. Most of us don't even know who our father is. They have an entire hustle. What's that hustle with that DNA garbage, which is nothing? Ancestry.com. They're doing documentaries on it now. Some devils, he goes and puts the, the, the cotton swab in his cat's mouth, puts it in the damn thing, sends it off. They say, You are from Africa. It's cat um, DNA on the thing. Go look it up. Go Google it. People are finding out that is a ridiculous hustle. It's like Bitcoin. It's a stupid hustle. It's something for idiots and children, for kids that love to play and imagine things. So now you get to be a descendant of Shaka Zulu because that's what you want to be anyway. So if you pay somebody enough money, you'll get a piece of paper that says you are a descendant of Thomas Jefferson. You are a descendant of George Washington. You are, you are a Zulu tribesman. Whatever, man. Whatever. There, there, will, there is a time coming when you will not be ashamed of who you are. The world will envy you. Your servants will envy you. That's right, sir. Keep going. Carl Khan said, World without end. Say that again. World without end. One more time. World without end. Israel is that world that Jesus Christ died for. Israel is that world that he promised he would save. He promised he would deliver. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that promise. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ came to save the world of Israel. Now, if you're an Israelite, whosoever you are, if you're an Israelite, you can be saved, man. I don't care who you are. I don't care how terrible you think you are when your mother told you that you were or the news or the media tells you that you are. You can change and be delivered. It was promised in the Old Testament, and Jesus Christ came to fulfill it up. Everybody understand. That's all I can do for time's sake. You, you, can, you can give them the precepts. You can write it down in the chat room if you need to, all of them. I think that's it. It might be the one in John. That's one, more, that's one more, sir, real quick. Well, go ahead, please. If you want it's to. the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse oh, 21. Right. Keep going. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. On the street, read that about two, three times. So the Christian can hear it, know that that's exactly what he wants, whosoever, and then, of course, you explain to him what the whosoever it is. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Keep going. Oh, God. Ye men of Israel. Keep going. Oh, hear these words. That's what you need. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. When the Lord said whosoever, he was never, he never even wanted our oppressors to hear it. That's right, sir. Do you understand? He wasn't talking to them. He was talking to Israel. So for sure it can't be, it can't mean that this is for everyone on the earth because he was only talking to the men of Israel. That's it. The men of Israel are in charge of the families of Israel. And he was trying to lead them so they could lead their families so we could get the salvation that has been promised for us, as opposed to the oppression that we're getting because of our punishment. Everyone understand? All right, next, any questions? Go, go, go ahead. Brother, what a question on how the man carries the seed. Well, young man, we gotta talk about sex for a few minutes. <laughs> And where babies come from, all right? Babies come from sperm. That's how. That's where life comes from, right? Everything. The Bible says everything has a seed within itself. You can give that to the young brother, all right? Every seed within itself, all right? Everything that exists right now, the seed to make that thing in biology.
comes from that thing. You want to make anything, you got to go to the thing that you want to make. And the seed is in it. And there's seeds in everything and strawberries and things. Some of you don't think have seeds. They have seeds, right? Strawberries have seeds. Seedless grapes have seeds. They're small, little, tiny seeds, right? Marketing tells, marketing calls them seedless. But there's actually a seed in every seedless grape. That's how you make, blow my mind. There's a seedless grapes. That's how you get more of them, right? Otherwise, you would run out of seedless grapes because you couldn't make any more, right? There's a seed of, there's a seed inside everything, right? The, the, the part of the, um, the specific part, the, the, the specific, how can I describe this? The male carries a seed. The male carries a seed in nature and everything, in plants, in animals, and blah, blah, blah. The male carries the seed of that thing, right? If you, if you want to make puppies or kittens, you need a male cat, and then you get a female cat. The male cat puts his sperm in the female cat, in a few months, you have kittens. That's also where babies come from. Come on. Oh, um, is it is it the same way to determine the type of dog? Like, um, there's no such thing as mixed dog either. Okay, I mean, there. It's all of that is marketing. That's the same thing, like seeing this grapes and this grape and that grape. When you're selling dogs, there's a mixed dog because you're selling dogs, and a mixed dog is cheaper than a pure dog. So those terms are for selling dogs. You get my point? That's the point. But every dog is mixed. That's how they come up with breeds of dogs. Mixing a little bit of this one, a little bit of that one. They come up with a dog and now they want you to buy it. How do they come up with different cows? A little bit of this cow, a little bit of that cow. When I say a little bit of it, I mean make this cow have sex with this cow. Then you'll have cats. Not every calf is what you want, but one of those calves is just what you want. Take that calf, make it have sex with a girl calf that's like you want. You mix it all up, you have whatever thing you think you can sell to people who buy livestock or animals. You get my point. Come on. Is this a little thing how they do the horses? So it's exactly it's everything. It's everything that is walking around now. Everything. You get my point? There is nothing that this is not done on. So many people a few years uh, last year were terrified of what was that thing? Genetic something. GMO? GMC? What does that mean again? GMO? Yeah, that's been going on for about 10,000 years. 10,000 years. People have been trying to take this, a, a branch from this plant, they tie it to another plant because this branch is it fights off insects better than this, than this plant. And they tie it to it hoping that it will grow together, and then as it grows, the fruit that comes from it will be a combination of those two plants. It's in the Bible with the wild olive tree that was grafted in. Grafting something in is genetic modification. It's what it is. It's you as a planter trying to make a plant that's bigger, that doesn't die as fast, and that is more resistant to pestilence. So people can eat. It's been going on for about 10,000 goddamn years. Everybody understands, right? Well, that's where seeds come from. So the man of the species, that's the word I was trying to look for earlier, got that. The male of the species carries a seed. It's in his penis. He puts it into a woman when they fall in love. Sometimes a man and a woman will fall in love with one another. And because they love each other so much, they will make a baby, right? By putting his his penis inside a woman's vagina because they truly love each other and they are of age and they have they have a marriage that has been brought together by the authority figures in their life. They will have permission to have sex when they become adults and they will make a baby, which is you. Clap it up for the brother. Next question. Brother wanted to know is ramen noodles lawful, sir? Yes. Next question. Well, not the shrimp flavor. 
All right? If that's what you, <laughs> Salaki, I answered too fast. He's, he's probably sitting in front of a crab ramen noodle about to tear it off, about to destroy it. Not the crab flavor, not the shrimp flavor, not the pork bacon flavor, but just chicken flavored ramen noodles are lawful, all right? Or mushroom or whatever you're getting down with, all right? Just no, nothing that is, no flavoring that is unlawful because they put, you know, the essence of shrimp, or, you know, shrimp juice or shrimp, blah, 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 in the flavoring packet, all right? I wouldn't make, you know, it's lawful, that's all I can tell you. Go ahead. Come, come, brother, we're going to break down in Zephaniah, the third chapter, verses one through four. Go ahead. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 1. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. We did one more time. Kind of a sir. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. Yeah, that's it. This is an excellent precept. What's that other precept about a city? Um, come on. It's my advocate to a 12 woe. Woe to the what? Woe to her that woe to them that establish the city on blood. That's a, that's another one. That's perfect. I'm thinking about a different one. To the city, some type of wicked city in the Bible. But that's a precept for it. All right, you'll find it. The other officers will know it. All right. So so now, this is a perfect precept. You can use this precept for our oppressor. If you're in the UK, you can use it for the for the UK, for London, for Germany. For Trinidad, you can use it to whatever city our oppressor rules out of. Everyone, everyone understands, or whatever country our oppressor rules out of. Read it one more time. Come on, come. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted mm -hmm. to the oppressing city. Keep going. She obeyed not the voice. She understand? The oppressing city is filthy and polluted. It's disgusting. It's vile. How many years have we told you to stop eating the abominations of these heathens? And now, damn near everyone in the earth died. About 10% of everyone on the planet died from a disease that came from eating bats and pangolin, right. which is an adorable little, look like an aardvark, a, a, I forget, what's that thing, armadillo. And they eaten that damn thing up, and because of it, everyone has to die from the same region that the SARS virus came from. Right. A few these masks all of us have to wear now, they were wearing these in China about 10 years ago. Right. The same exact reason that caused the SARS virus from eating pigs, kept eating, kept eating abominations, and killed damn near everyone on the planet up with now the COVID-19 virus. You better start to learn up. You better smarten up. Right. That's what you better do up. You better start to obey your hard head. You're hard-headed, and this evil city is hard-headed. Keep going. Come on, come on. Come on. Well, so I think Trooper Shiraz posted the description he was referring to. Go ahead. It was Nahum 301, Go to the Bloody City. That's the one I want. Give him a hand. <laughs> These are all precepts. All right, good to go. Next. Come on, come on. Oh, next question, sir? If I, if I answered that one, how long will Come on. Am I, am I missing a question in the room? If so, you just raise your hand, right? And I'll get to you. Go ahead. Khan Khan. Brother said, Shalom, Shalom, sir. Shalom, if I may. Ecclesiastes 6 and 3. Is that a metaphor saying that you won't have any understanding and slowly lose your life? Let's hear it. Khan Khan, this is the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 6 and verse 3. Thou shalt eat up thy leaves and lose thy fruit. And leave thyself as a dry tree. Thou shalt eat up thy leaves and lose thy fruit. And what else? Come, on, come. And leave thyself as a dry tree. Let me let me catch up with you right here, right? Let me make this jog my memory and taste. Go ahead. Um, tell me where you are again. I'm in Ecclesiasticus, sir, chapter six and verse three. Ecclesiasticus. Where was it me? What, what, what chapter? Uh, the sixth chapter and the third verse. Sir. The sixth chapter and the third verse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
All right, this is what you need. Let's read two. You said third, three, right? Yeah, come on, come on. let's read two. Three. Two should explain it, all right? Go ahead. Right, right. Ecclesiastes first, chapter six and verse two. Go ahead. Extol not thyself in the counsel of thy own heart. Read that again. Extol not thyself in the counsel of thy own heart. Extol not thyself. Who wants to look up what the word extol means? That's what you need. Let's do it fast, all right? Extol. You need the Webster's Dictionary in your phones. Extol. Young word. Past tense. It's past tense. Uh, no, extol is in past tense. Extol, I think, is an adjective or an adverb, right? Extol. Come on. Come on. Extol. To praise highly. That's what extol is. Extol is to praise highly, right? Arrogance. Self-pride. Right? That's what extol is. When you praise yourself, when you think you are the best, you are the man, you're everything, no one is as good as you. Right? That's ridiculous and stupid, and it really makes you look small. It's a terrible trait to be someone that, is, that extols themselves. Everyone understands? Paul said, thou has made me a fool in glorifying myself. Paul didn't want to talk about his righteous deeds and his miraculous works, but he knew if he didn't do it, you would go follow some fool who does. Everybody understands? And so he had to do it. Read it again. Come, come. Extol not thyself in the counsel of thy own heart. Extol not thyself in the counsel of thy own heart. And you, what's your own heart? Your mind. So in your mind, don't praise yourself. Don't do that in your mind. When you talk about yourself, to yourself. Don't talk about how wonderful you are, how great you are. Some of you are shocked right now that you haven't been raised up. You wonder why you don't get raised up. You don't deserve it. That's why. Don't ask yourself about yourself. Ask someone else about yourself. You can't know yourself. Only someone else can know you. You can't know you because you're too biased for yourself. Some of you are hate yourself so much that you belittle yourself. Some of you love yourself so much that you aggrandize yourself and wonder why you don't get all the power and money and rank and authority and, and vagina that exists because you are stupid and an idiot. But only I can tell you that. You can't tell yourself that because you don't believe that, but I'll tell you. Everybody understands that, all right? Uh, Read it one more time. No, one time, sir. Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and verse 2. Extol not thyself at the counsel of thy own heart. Don't do that. Keep going. Come on, That thy soul be not torn in pieces as a bull straying alone. Here we go. This is why you shouldn't praise yourself to yourself. So that your soul is not torn in pieces as a what? Come, come, as a bull straying alone. As a bull straying alone. Meaning if a bull, if a bull is outside of the pack, and then I call it pack, what is it called, a herd? If a bull is alone and not in the herd, what will that bull do? Rip, kill, and destroy everything in its path. Everything. That bull has to be in the herd where he can be directed. But if that bull leaves that herd off, he'll run into your goddamn tent. Kill everything. He's a bull. Well, that's what will happen to you if your pride precept. I'm up. Oh, pride into the fourth destruction. Pride cometh before a fall. A proud man only has one place to go, and that's down. And in here, we'll escort you there. I'm sure you understand. Keep going. Come on, come on, verse 3. Thou shalt eat up thy leaves and lose thy fruit and leave thyself as a dry tree. So now you're this wonderful, imagine yourself as this wonderful big tree. You're going to eat up your leaves. Your leaves are going to be gone. And you're going to wither and become dry because you're going to be destroyed because you were so proud. Right? That's the point. Don't praise yourself in your head. 
in your mind. Don't think you're everything. Know that you know I love you. But I'm telling you with that rap music, you think you like rappers and rappers love to you know self-aggrandize themselves. Before rap, it was the same way with the blues music. They did the same thing. And you don't want to, that's entertainment. <laughs> okay, that's not real. Right. You don't want to think actually like that. <laughs> Do you understand? That's that's not true. It's just someone trying to entertain kids, all right? But you don't want to think like that in reality because then someone is going to destroy you like a loose bull. Everybody gets it. Anything else? I believe that's his answer. That was his answer. Anything else? Um, so like uh, brother asked, did they lack a brotherhood when a brother puts you down in front of his wife and doesn't come to you and you alone? Okay. In... This is, a, this is a question that is better answered with specifics in a council, all right? In a council, because, because these, the specifics matter to a question like this, all right? If this happened to you, go to that brother and take him to council. Go to him and tell him. That's how you handle this problem. Now, you're asking me a question in general. I will have to answer it in general. But it doesn't mean it applies to your specific situation. Does everyone understand? In general, you should never chastise a brother in front of his wife or, or your wife. In general, you should not do that. In general, if you see it and you want to do it, you should find a time when these sisters are not there. That's in general. Everyone understands. Does that mean that there will never be a situation where you have to do it? There could be a situation where you must do it in front of his wife, in front of her, your wife. Can I give you a couple? The brother is drunk out of his goddamn mind in front of his wife or your wife. And you try and you say, well, brother, cool out. You might have had a little too much to drink. Come on with me over here. No, that's that. This and that and blah, 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 blah. If you didn't know, <clears throat> there's two things that General Yohanna has get released me to go to war with. Him. And I'm going to go to war with it, brother, if it destroys all of you. And that is drunkenness. And there's a catfish that I'm setting a trap for, too. There's a catfish, brother, I think about day and night. When I catch this catfish, I am going to wipe out the memory of anyone that has anything to do with it. They'll be gone, disappear. And drunkenness. Drunkenness, like I'm going to war with her. I mean, General Yohanna has released me. And when he releases me to do something, brother, I consider it God telling me to wipe you out. Then I'm going to do it. I'm going to find drunks, people that can't control themselves. There are some people that think because alcohol is allowed, that you're able to you're able to come into the UPK and be a stinking drunk in here. You are not. I'm going right. to find you and get rid of you. Everybody understands that. What's, what's the precept I was just talking about again? Break it down for me one more time. Oh, so like your brother was asking if, uh, you know, it was, uh, say it again. So like, he was asking, sir, you know, is it a lack of brotherhood? Yeah, your brother put you, you got a brother. He's a stinking drunk. And you try to not chastise him in front of women in front of his wife or her wife, but he won't stop. So then finally you have to say, ah, shut your mouth. Sit down, be quiet, pull up your pants. Stop pissing on yourself. Stop fighting everybody in bars. You know what, do you know what that drunk will do when you do that? He'll go, you gonna talk to me like that in front of the sisters? I can't believe you did that. I don't even believe you did that. Whenever someone gets the punishment for their crime, it, in their mind, that's the first crime that ever got committed that day. You understand? There was no crime before that. The police used to come lock me up, and I'd be like, what is this all about? <laughs> oh, I remember they got me one time. I was coming out to some bar. The evil was nigga alive. Some cat in some bar. Brother, I punched him, broke his jaw, and smacked his wife. <laughs> when they came and got me, I said, what is this shit? What is all this going on? Why? Because in my head, 
This was right that I did this. You understand? This was absolutely warranted. This this was it really it was his fault. You get my point. And that wife too, mind her business. All of that was them. Come to find out I was wrong, man. <laughs> Come to find out they didn't agree with me. Everybody understands when you get caught for something, you think that's the first wrong. So there are some drunks who will sit around angry because you checked them in front of their wife when they left you no choice. That's why this question has to be answered in counsel with the specifics. In general, you shouldn't do that. But you shouldn't need to either. I pray you understand. Keep going. So, uh, yeah, I think it's just the one to uh, break down Leviticus 19 and 19. It's the book of Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 19. You shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with a mingled seed. Neither shall a garment mingle of linen and woolen come upon thee. Sister, all this is speaking about is not cheating people. We went over this earlier with mixed dogs and purebred dogs. Don't sell a pure, don't get money for a purebred dog, and it's a mixed dog. That's what that means. Don't let thy cat of gender. Meaning, when you buy something in Israel, it is what they say it is. That's the point of this precept. This is a precept against fraud. You understand fraud, like catfishing. Catfishing is a big, giant fraud. And those frauds are going to be found out. And the people committing those frauds are going to be sinners and guilty of the punishment that comes with being a sinner, right? You sell someone a car, you tell them that this is a brand new, you know, Mercedes, but really you put a Ford's engine in that Mercedes, right? You just gendered that Mercedes with a Ford. Do you understand? You can't do that, right? If you're going to have business, which is what this is about, you and your personal life can do whatever you want, right? In your personal life. But remember, this Bible is speaking about how a nation governs itself. And in this nation, you can mix things up because then you can sell mixed up things. And you can lie about it and now make money that you shouldn't have made. And now someone has been cheated by you. And cheating each other is against brotherhood. We can't have peace if we cheat one another. Right. If, if, we, if you and I do business and I lie and cheat, from you, then how will we have peace among ourselves? We can't. So the Bible has rules that back in the day we used to call them civil laws. Laws that are put in place to make sure no one takes advantage of another. This is bedrock in those civil laws. Everything he just read. Everyone understands. Keep going. That was Next question. Uh, that was those questions. Solid. Any questions in the room? Not give you some. Oh, so like the brother wanted to break down the uh, so called Holy Trinity. So, uh, so uh, go ahead. I, I just wanted to general break down. The so called Holy Trinity is the belief that um, Jesus Christ, the Father of God, and the Holy Spirit are three separate entities as well as being a three-headed man all in one combined, right? That's the Holy Trinity. The brothers told me that the purple self-homosexuals believe the same thing, that they are the Holy Trinity, the God, the Father, and the Son, and I didn't believe it until they showed me the damn video and there it was, all right? That is a very Christian concept. It's a very Roman Catholic concept, which means it's a very Roman concept. The Romans would call it the triumvirate. Right. Look that up. The triumvirate was three politicians, three powers that came together as one. So they were two things at the same time. They were separate and they were like a, a you know, like Voltron. Who's old enough to know what that is? No one. You, you give him a hand. You know, I know you know in the back. Voltron. Where you're separate and then. Why about you come together 
all as one. That's Roman nonsense myth. Right? What people call the so-called Holy Trinity, brother, is not that. The Holy Spirit is the Most High God. Christ is separate from the Most High God, but he's also one with the Most High God because he agrees with everything the Father tells him to do. Like a soldier. Like a soldier. That's what Christ said. Christ, Christ, when Christ was about to be killed, brother, he said, Lord, if I if, if, if thou wilt, let this cup pass from before me. Right? Imagine a metaphor of someone giving you a cup to drink. But you're like, nah, I don't want to drink that cup. Let it pass. Nevertheless, thy will be done. The cup that represented the death that he was about to suffer, he didn't want to do it. He wanted it to pass, but the Most High wanted him to drink, and he did it. He is one with the Father. He followed orders. He agrees. He obeys. Now, as far as this Roman mess with this triumvirate, this three-headed eagle, that you can look that up in the Bible as well, the three-headed eagle, which is what the Romans believed in, is myth and stupidity and not real. I just, in essence, broke down the precept for you that they use. There are three that beareth record in heaven, three that beareth record in earth. That's the precept they use for the myth of the um, Trinity. There is no separate being that is the Holy Spirit. There is none. The Most High is the Holy Spirit. Give me this precept. Give me. I will send one and he will teach you all things about that. And you need the other one. I just, I just paraphrased, all right? How are we looking? We're going upstairs after the Duke Commander General on your harness show. You know anything about that? One second. Barra's not here, right? I'm not sure, sir. Don Yala, you better start making some phone calls about that, all right? Let me know. Let me know if I need to go upstairs in a second or not, all right? So I think it's all on John. You have the key, you die? Lie. Come on. I think it's John 14 and 26. John 14 and 26. Go ahead and read that. Come on, the John 14 and verse 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. But the what? The Holy Spirit. Read one verse above. The book of John, chapter 14, and verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the comfort, which is I'm the sorry, let's go up a little bit above to give, give me some context for everyone. All right. I'm going to go to the concept. It's the book of John, chapter 14, and verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him. And we'll come unto him and make our abode with him. And my what? My abode. No, no, no. And my who, who's going to come unto him? Come, come. And my father will love him. Wait, and we will. Wait, you got to read this very slow because no one in the world even sees this, even though they read it. Come on, boys. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Come, come. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. If a man loves me, this is Yahweh Shai Christ talking. If a man loves me, he will keep my word. Hold on one second. Bear with me. Come on, come on. All right, go ahead and read it again. Come on, come on, sir. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. That should be that should show you that there's no sincere Christian. None. Right. 
There's no sincere Christian right there, which means also there is no Christian that loves Christ. None. All of that garbage love talk. Christians make me sick, especially when they talk about loving God. Like that is the worst thing I, I like to hear about from a Christian is how much they love God. It's all hypocrisy, all false, all a hustle. If a man loves Christ, he will keep his words. Christ says something, you'll do it because he said it. That's love. Love is so simple. It's simple, but you make it so hard. You make it so hard. So, something else people always tell me. Someone does something stupid. And then they say, but General, I didn't mean to do that. That's not what I meant to do. And you know what I always think to myself? If you didn't mean to do what you did, who did mean to do it? Here's my cup. I'm drinking this cup. Listen, y'all, I don't mean to be drinking this cup. I'm telling you right now. I do not mean to do this. I do not mean to drink this cup. I don't mean to do it. I'm telling you right now. Well, then you watching me would have to go, if you didn't mean to do it and did it, then who wanted you to do it? Maybe someone else wanted you to do it. Who can blow my mind right now? Danielle, maybe a demon wanted to give him a hand. Maybe they wanted it. Watch yourself whenever you say, I know I did that, but I didn't mean to do that. That's, that's not what I didn't tell that ain't what you wanted. You wanted to do something different. You wanted to go home and just and read the Bible that night. But instead of going home and reading the Bible, you went out and shot him. Well, then who meant to do it? You didn't. Clearly, you didn't mean to do it. Oh, you had sex with that sister. Yeah, but you didn't mean to. So who did mean to? Damn, that's a lot for somebody to do that they don't want to do at all. Everybody understands Christians are liars. They don't love Christ. They don't love Jesus because if they did, they would listen to him, obey him, read. He will keep my words and my father will love him. If you obey the words of Christ, then the, the, the father of Christ We'll love him. Meaning, so now you obey Christ because you obey Christ. The Father loves you like you love Christ. Christ and the Father are separate, but they're one. They're on one accord. They agree. You follow Christ, and because you follow Christ, the Father protects you. This should be simple to understand. Without your self-will, and your envy and greed and guile and lust. This would be just a very simple concept. You would need the very complicated concept of God and the Father and the Holy Spirit being one Voltron. That's complicated to understand, right? There's a triangle that they teach you in theologi theological, school, theological school that's supposed to make you understand the Trinity and it makes no goddamn sense at all. But here's what does make sense. I work for Christ. Whoever works for Christ gets paid by the Father. I get it. No sweat. I got you. I love Christ. The Father loves me. Done. I'll take it like that. I'm in. Sign me up. Keep going. Come will come, sir. And will come unto him. And, and what? And will come unto him. Who will come unto him? The Father. The Father loves and will come unto him. Christ just said that the Father will come unto the man who loves Christ. Now you're gonna need that for later, all right? Remember that. Go ahead. Come, come. And make our abode with him. And make our abode with him, meaning we're going to live with him. We're going to live with the Father. The Father is gonna live with him, meaning you're under the Lord's protection. Because you obey Christ. Everybody gets it. Keep going. Oh God. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hears is not mine, but the fathers which sent me. Everybody understands. That is the Christian church. Huh? If you don't obey Christ, 
then you're rejecting the words of God because they are on one accord. Christ is speaking the words of God, not because he is God, but because he is a soldier for God. Keep going. Come on, verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you being yet present with you. Mm -hmm. But the comforter. But the what? But the comforter. But the comforter. When I was with you, I told you these things. I told you about this. But the comforter. Now remember that term, comforter. The root word is what? Comfort. Right. And if you need a comforter, what are you? If you need a comforter, then you must be someone else. Officer in the back. Okay. If you need a comforter, you must be uncomfortable. Right? Otherwise, why would you need a comforter? Unless you are uncomfortable. You need an air conditioner. Turn the air conditioner on. I know one thing about that man that said that. What do I know about him, sister? If I say, turn on the AC, turn on the air conditioner, what do I know about that man that says that? Well, we could turn it on. If he say, if he's telling me, turn on the air conditioner, there is a fact that I know about him by him even giving me the order to turn it on. Do you know you want to give it a shot? What is it? He must be. The air conditioner man? He must be hot. Give her a hand. He must be hot. If you want the air conditioner, you surely you would not turn on the air conditioner if you were comfortable. You would never turn it on. Everybody gets the point, right? Well, Christ is telling his men that they're going to be sent the comfort because Christ knows what about his men? That they are going to be uncomfortable. What is the comforter? The thing you need when you're afraid, when the Romans are trying to kill you, when the Sadducee and Pharisee are trying to kill you, when the rich and the powerful hate you, those things make you afraid. What is the comforter? Courage. That's what the comforter is. Why are you uncomfortable? Because you're scared. That's what makes you uncomfortable. You're scared. You're, you, you're told to go teach, but you're scared to go out on that street corner. So many of you have been through this, your first speakings, where you, you're told to go out and teach, and you're like, oh, God, we're going to get shot, arrested. My mama said we were going to get shot. My mom, said, my mom told me, you go out on that street corner, you are going to be killed. That was 27 years ago. Hey, I am drinking scotch with you today. Everybody understand. Right? So many of you go through this. If, you, if you're a woman, if you join the UPK, they're going to beat you to death, whoop your ass and kill you. Women always hear that. Right? People always, you know, there's, a, there's an amount of fear that comes with being in the UPK. Right? That you have to face. It's part of it. But the Most High will send you a comfort. That comforter is courage, man. We are no cowards in here because of the comfort. Right, everyone, everyone understands, right? Oh, wow. Christ promised this courage. He promised it. He said he would send it. He said you would do something that everyone else would be terrified to do. That's what you're doing. The life you're living now, sometimes you can forget when you're in the truth. But brother, think about you before you were ever in the school. And think about what you would think of what you're saying and doing. <laughs> like, like you would look at that like, that's a crazy nigga to do something like that. I saw brothers that used to carry their Bible and satchels on their hip, which I've been trying to find someone to bring back again. They would attach it to their belt, their belt, and then tie it around their leg like a gun, like an old school gun holster. But it was a Bible in it. And I saw it and I would go, Cats got to have guns. I'm saying that, and that was in the early, early 90s when everyone was terrified of Muslims. They were terrified of the Malcolm X and Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, especially in Philly. Why? Because in Philly they kill everybody the Muslims. 
kill everybody. One Muslim cat killed some cat for saying something bad about Elijah Muhammad, cut the stomach out of his wife's baby, and drowned the baby in the sink. Then his co-conspirator said, yo, why are you drowning the baby in the sink? The cat said, well, his father is an infidel. And if I don't kill this baby, he'll become an infidel too. You can go Google this. You can go look this up. That was the Muslims. I go by, I go in Philadelphia and see somebody throwing a Quran up and down the street, stepping on a cobblestone, a rock that says Kaaba on it, and they're throwing it and battling Muslims up and putting them in their place. And I said to Jerome Mayak, who's standing next to me, there gotta be guns in them satchels. Ain't no way no cat would say nothing like that without having a gun. Until the cat reached in it and pulled out a Bible, I damn near fainted. <laughs> Damn near fainted. I said, sign me up. I'm in. Everybody understand? I'm in. Where do I sign up? Where's the school? Those cats were very comfortable of where I was not. But they were comfortable because they had to come for turf. Everybody understands. Keep going. Come on, come on, sir. Which is the Holy Spirit. Which is what? The Holy Spirit. Which is the Holy Spirit. That comforter is the Holy Spirit. It is the true spirit. It is the spirit of God, which is the other precept I don't have time to give you. The, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of God. Keep going. Come, come. Whom the Father will send in my name. The Father will do what? Send you the Holy Spirit in the name of Christ. Remember, you work for Christ. If you obey Christ, the Father will pay you. If you if you love Christ, the Father will love you. The Holy Spirit is God's spirit. Now, what's a spirit? A spirit is a vibe, a personality. That's why there's a Christmas spirit. Right. If a cat has on a stupid reindeer t-shirt and antlers and wearing a white beard and a, carrying a red sack, he has the Christmas spirit. Meaning he is the embodiment of Christmas. If you have a, 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 a scary mask on and you're giving out trick or treat candy, that's the spirit of Halloween. You might love your football team or your basketball team. That's the spirit of the Eagles or of the Giants. You're in their spirit, right? You're in the football spirit, the basketball spirit. That's a vibe of personality. There is a spirit that is God's spirit. It's the Holy Spirit in the back. Oh, it's like that on 1 Corinthians 2 and 11, sir. Mm -hmm. All right, come, come. This is on 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. But what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Everybody ever give him a hand. That's a perfect precept. So all while the Catholics are thinking that the Holy Spirit, the Catholics believe that the Holy Spirit is a woman named Grace. You can go look this up. Usually she's depicted as a black woman. And her name is Grace. And she is the Holy Spirit. And she's like a ghost to something. You know, like a special deity of being. The Holy Spirit is God's personality. Just like the Christmas spirit or the spirit of football or basketball or anything else. It's a person acting the way God would act. Wanting the things that God wants. Being zealous. Zealous for God. Just like the Christmas spirit or the football spirit or any other goddamn spirit. Everybody understands. It's a personality which the Father will give you. Meaning, what gives you the courage to say what you say? The spirit of God. That's why we do it and we're not afraid. Because of the spirit of God. That's why we're no cowards, because of the spirit of God. Not because we're great, not because we're something you know that no one would ever try to harm, but because we love Christ and the Father gives us this personality. Everyone understands. Keep going. Come on, come on, sir. I might. Oh, oh, it's like I got one more thing, sir. Go ahead. This is on Matthew 7, verse 11. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, 
how much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask? That's this is a precept of what we just we're bringing out right now. Everybody gets that. Let me wrap it up. Keep going. Call on the card, sir. John chapter 14 and verse 24. Mm -hmm. He that loveth me not and keepeth not my sayings. Oh, it's like verse 25. These things that I have spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, mm -hmm. he shall teach you all things and bring all things. Who to shall earth. teach you all things? Remember it said he. That he is where the belief that the Holy Spirit is a separate entity, entity comes from, the he. Right. Who shall teach you all things? Young man right here, young brother right here. Who is the he that will teach you all things? The Lord, the Most High. We read that at the top. Read it, Read the first verse we read. Come, come. But the comforter. No, the first one at the top. When we started, Conor and verse 23. Yes. Conor and Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he keepeth not my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. I think you read about it. One more verse above that, I think. Conor, he that loved me not. It was when the father will come be with him. The father will be with him. I believe it's something you read earlier. It might be farther down or it might be right there. Meaning, the Lord is saying that the Father will be with you if you're with Christ. It's right there at the top. Of, we might have just read it or skipped around or something like that. Sis. Read that, please. Oh, he that loveth me not, keep him not my sayings. And the word which here is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Keep going. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the comforter, which is the oh, Holy Spirit. Read, read 23. Come, on, come. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. Mm -hmm. And my father will love him. That's what you need. My father will love him. Keep going. And we will come unto him. And we will what? Come unto him. Come unto him. Keep going. And make our abode with him. And make who will make our abode with him? It's right here. Christ. And the Father. That's right. the we. That's the we. Christ and the Father. Now, farther down, we're reading. Now, skip down to where we were. Go ahead. But the Comforter. Read 22. Judas said unto him. That's not it. I might. No, 21, sir. 21. Go ahead. He that had my commandment. This is it. The what I might give him a hand. Go ahead. Read it again. John 14 and 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he is it that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be the love of my father. That's what you need right there. Keep going. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Keep going. Judas said unto him, Thou spirit, Lord, how is that that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Mm -hmm. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will. Meaning, what Judas, not a scary, is trying to say is, is that how will you show us who you are, but won't show the masses of society who you are? And Christ is explaining, I'm showing you who I am because you love me. And I'm not going to show them who I am because they don't love me. Right. That's the point. You are going to receive the Holy Spirit, which the Father will send in my name. And he shall do what? Come, come. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love no, no, me, down. And which the Father shall send in my name, and he shall what? Come, come. He shall teach you all things. All I need is the he. I read all that above 22, 21, all of that. That's to get the he from you. Out. Who's the he? He shall teach you all things. We've only been talking about one he, period, right. sister. Give her a hand. Yeah, that's the he we, when do we mention above it some other being? The Father will come. The Father will protect you. The Father will abide with you. The Father will give you because you stood.
stood for Christ, you love Christ, the Father will love you. He will teach you all things. God is the Holy Spirit. It's his spirit. The way we act in the UPK, it's strange to you, but it is how heaven is. Right. The way we act, the way we dress, the way we talk, our loud voice. How many times have I heard it? What Y'all yelling all the time, yelling on the street corner. You know why we yell, right? Because he yells. Right. He yells. He's loud. He speaks like this on this topic. This is how he speaks. Everything, the masculinity, we're, you know, to you, we're overly masculine. We're like masculine, you know, ridiculously mas masculine. Because he is. He's a man of war. Our beards, our braids, the boots, everything is because that's how he is. The way we treat each other, that's how he would treat you. Our personality is his personality. He's here. He's the one that's giving us this courage. He's the one that is teaching us, sister. Yeah, I wanted to know, like, as far as talking loud, mm -hmm. that's how they talk in heaven. Yeah. Um, Yahweh Shah, like, when it gives a, 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 an analogy, a figure of what he speaks like when it says he has the voice of many waters. Give her, he, give her a hand. That's exactly the precept you should use your book. Yeah. The voice has the sound of many waters, roaring, raging tides. And people don't like it. And it makes people uncomfortable. It makes people afraid. But it is how God talks on this topic. It is how God speaks. I'm not. Come on. Um, come on, cut. So, um, I'm reading you on verse 10. Okay. Um, come on, cut. John 14 and 10. Believe us, thou, that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but of the Father that the Mother is in me. He doeth the works. This is this is one of the precepts that they use for the so-called Trinity. He is in me, and I am in I am in Him. This is not a Voltron situation. This is a unity situation. Us being together. This is rank. This is being on one accord. Father leads, Christ follows. That's how they're in each other. Everyone understand. With that, pass the class over to Prince Officer Daniel. Okay, well, I'm sorry. Exactly. The dates for the um, barbecues, the barbecues are coming up. Uh, General Hazayan is working on the dates right now. They'll be coming up soon. Uh, they'll be um, just waiting for the exact places. Watch Facebook, watch your camp leader um, protocols, the different websites and Facebook addresses or whatever that we have on social media to, to inform camp leaders. You'll find out about the barbecue dates. They're coming up quickly. Uh, get ready for them, get your cast together. We're gonna do what we always do, dwell together in peace and in harmony. Everyone understands.